Hello and welcome to Woolwich Contemporary Print Fair. My name is Lizzie Glendening and I'm the curator of the fair. Um, we're joined today by Catherine Oliver, who's leading a talk on how we make prints with three of our exceptional exhibiting artists. And um, this is the, the last one of the series, the last one of our webinar series. And if you've missed any of the talks over the past month, you can find them on the exhibition homepage. And there's a button at the top that says past talks and talks and tours and I really uh, recommend watching them but for today um, I want to give a brief introduction to Catherine and the artist she's discussing um, their sort of intricacies of um, their creative process. So Catherine Oliver we've collaborated with for a number of years she's been a great uh, supporter of the fair and last year she delivered a panel with a number of our artists. Um, so she was working in as a um, through the art sales for many years at the Royal Academy. And then last year, uh, set up her own company, Oliver Project, which um, champions Southeast London artists through some beautiful exhibitions. And today we're joined by three artists, Tamsin Relly, who both Kath and I worked with for many years, uh, who is a Southeast London artist. And, um, Tamsin um, shows some has shown some beautiful monotypes, um, which are part of the, the £100 of each sale this year is going to hospital rooms. Um, we're also joined by Sara Lee, who has shown with us a number of times and is also a London-based artist, and also Morteza Hackshaw, who joins us from California and has exhibited with us for the first time this year. So, um, what I'll do is hand it over to Catherine to talk uh, more in depth with the artists and thank you all for joining us and I hope you really enjoy this discussion. Thank you Lizzie, thank you. It's really amazing to be here with you all and I can see the numbers at the bottom of the screen totting up and there's nearly 50 of you now so I'm thinking about being in the building at Woolwich and kind of channeling the fair. Um, so we've got three artists that we're going to be talking to today and they all hail from different corners of the globe. We have Tamsin Relly, who was born in South Africa, but now lives and works in Southeast London. We have Morteza Hockshaw, who was born in Iran, but has joined us today from California. And we have Sarah Lee, who was born in Wales and now lives just down the road from me in Southeast London. And we're going to be talking to the artists about how they make their prints, using a diverse range of contemporary and traditional techniques. We're going to think about how printmaking weaves through their wider artistic practice and also discuss the relationship between the process of making prints and the content in the artist's work, because I think there are some really interesting connections there between actually making work and the ideas that artists explore in their visual languages. I know that some of you are printmakers and we all know that one of the really special things about printmaking is collaboration and many of these collaborations of course have had to be put on hold during the past few months but I do think that this situation that we've all lived through in the past year has really pushed artists to perhaps reevaluate their practices and experiment with new techniques um, and explore new ideas and that's something positive to have come out of this year and I think all three artists are going to talk to us a little bit today about about how their working practices have adapted this year. So we're going to spend a few minutes with each artist, um, probably about 15 minutes and there'll be time for questions at the end so please think of some questions um, to ask them. And I'm not going to put you through a Zoom slideshow. I think we've all had enough Zoom slideshows this year. We can't take any more, but we're just going to have one image of each artist's work that they are showing in the Woolwich Contemporary Print Fair online edition this year, just so that you can see their work and then we'll move on to talking to them um, in their working spaces. So I think we're ready to go and Tamsin Relly is going to be first. So if we could just see Tamsin's, can we see an image of Tamsin's work on the screen? Um, so these are Tamsin's colour studies, her monotypes, which she has shown and actually sold, I think, the majority of in the fair this year. And um, Tamsin and I have 
known each other for many years now. I discovered her work actually at the RA summer exhibition probably about 10 years ago, a little helicopter etching, which I've never forgotten. And we've worked together since on lots of group exhibitions in lots of different venues. So um, Tamsin, hello. Hi. <laughs> Hi, can you tell us all where you are today, where you're speaking to us from? Yeah, so I'm in my dining room. Um, I'm alone at home, quite unusually. <laughs> and I thought today I'd sit in front of my, I have a little rotating home studio wall that Lyra and I are actually sharing at the moment. My 18 month old daughter, she's started to bring crafty things home from the nursery so <laughs> they're going up on the wall um yeah and, and it's not your regular studio is it where's your where's your um your kind of permanent studio space and how how are you set up there yes yeah, so um i'm really lucky to have a lovely space to work about 10 minutes from here and i actually we have a press and printmaking set up in the studio and I share it with two wonderful printmakers Julia Paintner and Selga Miller um, and in a way this is quite a dream for me I've had the press for a number of years and I've always wanted to be able to share it as a resource and it's taken a long time to slowly find a couple of the right people to share with and we're having quite a lot of fun lately because we've been dedicating a few days each month to a different type of printmaking as a way of sharing our skills. So we focused on monotypes last a few weeks ago and currently Julia is kind of guiding us through through woodcuts. So yeah, we're having a good time. Amazing. And, and can you, for anybody who doesn't know your work, can you just briefly summarize your practice for us and what you're interested in? Sure. Um, at the core of it, I keep coming back to our relationship with um, and within nature. And I'm interested in how we reshape landscape, whether for um, industry or agriculture, but also how we might reconstruct natural spaces for conservation or leisure. Um, and really just wanting to recognize the impact that we have on our environment in terms of climate change and loss of biodiversity and all the earth's life support systems air and soil and, and water um and i guess behind all that really i just i think our planet and the diversity of life within it is so mind-blowing that perhaps a lot of what i'm making is really an ode to that and what is so precious within it um, and a call to help cherish and protect it, I guess. <laughs> and, and, and how has this year, how have the events of this year affected your practice and your yeah. working circumstances? Um, I mean, so my daughter was nine, month, nine months old when the pandemic, pandemic began. So I was just kind of coming out of the new parenting time where I hadn't had much time to make work at all, really. Um, I was looking after her full time and and so I had already been adapting to ways of working at home, either on a smaller scale or working with media that might, that could be resolved in a shorter time frame. I was beginning actually to make some monotypes at home and then when I could go down to the studio, take them down to print. Um, but back to your question of how the years change things. Yeah, reflecting on that, I feel as though almost like there's been a softening to what I've been making. Um, and there might be many reasons for that, but um, for me, it's sort of twofold. Although, I mean, we, globally, we've been through such a massively challenging time. There's also been, there's within that vulnerability, I feel like a lot of empathy has grown between people and it's also a tender time in a way we, you know, our hearts are with the people that we love and that we miss and can't see. Um, communities have come together and for me there, there is a tenderness in the air between it all and so yeah that has touched me somewhere. Um, and also coming back to having become a parent just 
my experience of pregnancy and having a baby and everything I found like things became quite soft focus for me for a while like I couldn't even I struggled to think in a very linear way boundaries blurred and there, there was this feeling of a soft focus for a while it's starting to fade now to be honest as I'm getting back into the run of things but yeah I feel like that's come in um perhaps to my mark making and the compositions or colors that I'm using and just lastly, I'll mention even subject matter wise, spending so much more time in the city and this opportunity to really be present with what's here and what's within walking distance um, with fewer, less traveling and less commitments in so many ways. I feel as though quite a few plants and trees that I hadn't really noticed before in the city have come into focus for me and I've been using them as subject matter and coming back to the same flowers and trees over and over again <laughs> just in a very slow way. Yeah and yeah. I, I think there is something about pace isn't there? Um, mm -hmm. So so why don't you tell us a bit more about about your the the monoprint process the water-based monotypes that you've been making because you you have made etchings haven't you but you've very much focused on this these unique prints in the past few months? Yes, exactly. I mean, etchings was, they were, I had been dedicated oil painter for, for many years actually, before I tried any kind of printmaking. Um, and I think the first to catch my attention was the simple trace monotypes that you can do. In fact, I recommend trying it at home because all you need is a roller and some ink and a flat surface and some paper. You, you draw through the back of the paper. So it, I was just amazed by how line could change so dramatically just um, and then I did a lot of etching when I uh, did my MA at City and Guilds but yeah for quite some years now actually my focus in terms of printmaking has been almost entirely on monotypes and they I was really drawn to them because they quite literally bring together painting and printmaking so um, yeah, I have one or two examples here. I'll just, we've got the, the slide is up, but this is a recent one. Um, and oh, okay. Actually, let me show you how, let's just start. Um, I wanted to share, I'm conscious of chatting for too long, but just uh, if you ever want to try making them, what you need is a bit of plastic acetate like this um, and some degrease powder that you use with etching as well. And you literally just paint onto the surface with, so you degrease it so the watercolor will stick. Um, and you paint onto the surface with watercolor and water soluble crayons. Um, and once that's dried, fully dried, which can take an hour or overnight or whatever, then you run that through the press, um, through a very heavy press with damp paper. So the watercolor pigment has you know, dried in, in the shapes of your marks and it amazes me how it transfers in a very crisp way onto that damp paper when it's run through the press. Mm -hmm. um, so. That drying, that drying period is really important, isn't it? Because we've talked about that before. And, and I think some, some people think that with these monotypes, it's a quick kind of, you know, painting onto the plate and then printing off straight away. But actually the business of drying them properly, drying them to the right level is really important, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, I don't have much experience with water, with, with oil-based monotypes, but I think the oil needs to be wet for those. But with, yeah, the watercolour needs to be just, yeah, absolutely dry and the paper needs to be just the right dampness. If it's too wet, I find the pigment can bleed. If it's too dry, um, it won't transfer properly. So there's a bit of science to it and I still often don't get it right. I uh, have some where it feels like they all flow really well and other times where you just get one dud after the other. Um, do, do you find that you reject do you find that you reject a lot of a lot of prints? What's your kind of ratio of Yeah, I think yeah. similar to the way that I paint, I, I do work quite quickly and as a result of that, um, 
there are definitely a number of of rejects. I don't know, probably at least a quarter, <laughs> if I'm on a, on a good day. <laughs> Um, and and your yeah. we we worked together this year on a show where we exhibited some watercolors that you had started to make, and you told me this wonderful story about finding this this or being given a given given a stack of paper or finding a stack of paper in the studio and just realizing all of a sudden that it was exactly the kind of paper that you'd been looking for for ages, and you started making these beautiful watercolors. So, what 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 is the relationship between those unique works and the prints? How do they kind of feed into each other and inform each other? Um, yeah, I mean, I do find that to begin with, although I'd been making water-based monotypes for, I don't know, five or six years now, I've never really been able to paint with watercolor straight onto paper. <laughs> I've always found it challenging. Um, but as you say, earlier this year, I found a certain type of paper that changed that for me and I was able to relate to the surface with the mark in a way I hadn't been able to before. Um, but I have found that working between oil painting, watercolour prints um, and different types of media that there's, they absolutely do influence one another. Like after I spent several months making mon water-based monotypes, I went back to my oil oil paints and my mark had changed entirely mm. because with the <clears throat> with the water based monotypes you're working on a very slippery surface it's not for myself i find you just don't have that much control so you pushing paint around and my mark became in a way much more immediate and perhaps a little bit looser when i then went back to working on canvas um and recently i've actually been Repeat, exploring the same image and composition over and over again in different media and seeing how the mark changes each time the composition changes depending on how the materials respond and 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 i think you've also been working on some digital uh prints that use polaroid photographs as a starting point which look com completely different actually mm -hmm. to the mono types yeah can you, can you tell us a bit about those yeah, um, I have one here. <laughs> they're, in your, they're in this year's summer exhibition, aren't they? One of them is. Yeah. One of them's in the summer so show. This, this the, one. The proof of one of them. Um, <laughs> and yeah, I think what's... So this is the first sort of archival pigment print. That, well, the second one I've been exploring. But um, yeah, I think what's common to my approach in each of these is that there's kind of working with the alchemy of the material, and in this case, that was the Polaroids rather than the creating the work. But the Polaroids, they, they're a very unreliable way of making images. Um, you can't get a crisp focus, the light is unpredictable, you can't, even your composition is a bit off. Um, and I also worked with multiple exposure, so I really enjoy it when you don't have that much control of the outcome initially in the making of an image. And um, yeah, you you can just, what what comes out of it is a, is a surprise really. So yeah, that's what excited me about. I mean, that's print, that, that's printmaking, isn't it? And that, that's why people yeah. get hooked on printmaking because you never, you know, that moment when you peel the paper off, you're never ever going to know a hundred percent what, what, what you're going to get. And I think that's why, you know, artists, one of the big reasons why artists continue to make prints and why they love making prints. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Is there yeah, anything think, else you want to show us, Tamsin? Is there anything oh, else that we've got what, there? I think we've got I another, it might, another minute or two with you, if you... Sure. Um, I thought it would... I mean, it's so curious, isn't it, that we have work in this wonderful exhibition but actually the work is at home with us <laughs> so I do have one which is on the show and I'm, I wanted to share it because I found in the studio the plate that I had used to make it amazing so I thought it would be a nice way of sharing so this is what's left on the plate after it's been printed so actually remains um but yeah so I painted on here printed it and then that that's what remains but you can wash this off and reuse the plates over and over again as well. Yeah. 
I love um, I love those. I love the plates. I'd love to see an exhibition of plate. Of the yeah, plate. so they, they are very. It's tempting to do things with them, and I did make one or two works layering them actually. Um, and oh, the last thing I wanted to show about the rainbows, but you you kind of hinted at at it was that each one is made by a combination of a different three colours. So all the the shades in between on the rainbow are mixed from. So this one was fluorescent red, lemon yellow and indigo. Um, and I actually started them, <clears throat> funny enough, like, feels like it was a month or so before COVID started and I was back in the studio for the first time just wanting to um, do something simple and technical and get back into colour. And <clears throat> it was a way of exploring palettes for, for other work. Um, yeah. Thank you so much, Tamsin. It's just, it's always so lovely to hear about your work and I've, I've loved watching it kind of evolve over the past few years. So thank you. Oh, thank you. There's a question here from Sumi. Um, I wonder if we can answer it quickly now. She says, oh yes, what's the, what's the paper that Tamsin discovered that changed her outlook on watercolour painting? That's a good question. You can all rush out and buy that paper now. <laughs> yeah, it's, um, it's a handmade Indian cotton paper by a brand called Khadi, K-H-I-D-I. -I. That's right. It's the and I've paper. since seen that there are other companies making similar paper, but it's quite tough. Um, and in a way it's chunkier than I've been drawn to working with before, but it's quite robust and it's sized. I think what's significant about it is that it's 100% cotton and it has a size, transparent size inside and on top. So um, it takes the mark, it makes, it creates quite a lot of contrast and you can layer with the watercolour. And, and, so, and just one, one quick question from Lizzie and then we'll move on um, because I'm, I'm watching my clock. Um, Tamsin, you've recently revisited painting based on your monotypes. Are you able to give us a quick insight into how you transcribe your print into a painting? Um, very loosely. So, um, yeah, thinking through, I went watercolor into monotype into a large painting. So there were a number of translations, with yeah. a large in between, I think, but yeah, quite loosely. So I would just, and I've only just done this in, a, I think, yeah, I haven't done much of this at all, but just referencing, I had the monotype in front of me in the studio and scaled it up to a much larger canvas actually. Um, the scale was quite surprising to me, actually. Oh, you saw it on yeah. Instagram. <laughs> Although everything's the same size on Instagram, obviously. But <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you, Tamsin. I think we're going to have to move on. We'll move on now to California to Morteza. Hello, Morteza. Can you hear Hi. us okay? Good morning. Yes, good morning. So t tell us where you are. Whereabouts are you speaking to us from? Yeah, I am in um, California, South California, about an hour uh, south of LA. And you're you're at home, aren't you? I'm at home. Yeah, I don't. My connection is not good in the studio, so I decided to see you here. T tell us what your tell us what your studio is like and where where it is. Uh, I have a small studio in a, um, in a in an art building in a um, town called Santa Ana. It's about fifteen minutes from here. Um, and and you are, are you able to make prints in your studio? I don't. Uh. No, no, I, I I don't have my own studio, and I have uh, I always make my prints uh, using other shops, um, especially when I go to residences. Okay. But my current studio is just mainly for drawing and painting. Now I I I've, I've actually discovered your work through the fair just this year, and I'm not sure how many other people are familiar with your practice, but maybe you could just tell us. Um, a little bit about your um, about your background in general, about your studies in Tehran and your move to California. Ah, uh, yeah, you know too much. Just well, quickly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I moved here from Iran about ten years ago, two thousand ten, um, and I I did my undergrad uh, in sculpture, uh, and then I got my master in uh, Columbus, Ohio, uh, in printmaking. Um, 
and I stayed there one year and, uh, and taught, and then we moved here to California last year. And, and how, how are you finding working in California? Um, well, it's, it, it's, it's interesting. It's a strange, uh, because we, we moved here and a couple months later, the pandemic happened. So, uh, in a way it doesn't really, it doesn't feel like I, we have moved because we just moved from a house to another house, except we have sunshine here every day. Uh, yeah. So, Which so in that regard, yeah, but I, I think I, I haven't had the uh, opportunity to discover, uh, really any any art community or anything like that yeah which is which is a pity i mean i think this business of working in isolation is a lot of artists were, were secretly quite pleased to be working in isolation at the beginning of all of this and now i think perhaps the novelty is wearing off a little bit yeah well um, it, it will end it will end it will end soon i i eternally optimistic so um i i mean that the representation of the male figure which is a, a big part of your practice um it's that i i actually think it's a pretty rare um rare subject in contemporary printmaking and certainly looking through the open call um at the woolwich fair there are hardly any artists um making depictions of the male figure um can you can you tell us a little bit about your just your summarize your practice for us and tell us tell us a bit about your interests in terms of the um, that you make right well in terms of male figures which um uh was mainly uh, uh was mainly the that uh, the core of my uh, i guess Im image making and uh i mean now it's changing slightly um there are some female figures also re appearing in my pictures but uh the the work that i have in the fair um was part of the series that I've I've been making for a uh, couple of years, and yeah, this image. Um, so I guess the interest in male figures, I think it it, it started when I uh, started exploring uh, my interest in history, contemporary history, uh, especially. Uh, so this is about three four years ago when I started. Uh, uh, discovering these uh, archival historical pictures of pre-revolutionary Iran, uh, of just formal gatherings of politicians. And these are, so this is before digital photography. So these are all analog. And as you can imagine, they're all kind of poor quality, sometimes out of focus and which all excited me. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not really interested in sharp and crisp and digital photography in general. Mm. So I, I, I was really interested in these images. Um, so it was mainly because of the history. But as you can imagine, most of the figures in these pictures, especially, so we are talking about maybe 40, 50 years ago, all these gatherings and meetings and these important people are mainly male. So these characters started, I, I tried to pulling out from those pictures and <clears throat> Uh, for a couple of years, I made pictures based on them uh, and just thinking about, uh, uh, I started kind of reconstructing the, the history that I knew and kind of making up these scenarios that never happened or uh, just kind of reimagining or kind of making silly scenarios. It's kind of just playing with these basically historical dolls, you know, for myself, just mm. creating games or some nonsensical, you know, uh, stories. Um, so I worked with these characters for, for a couple of years and this print I have in the fair is one of them. Uh, but later on, most, more recently at last, uh, starting maybe last year, uh, then, then, then I kind of started diversify these so all my characters now are not necessarily all politicians or historical figures. They're just male kind of in general. In They could be any like students, I don't know, or kids, uh, politicians or athletes or anybody really um, kind of exploring what is this, um, I don't know, this, what is it to me to, what does it mean to be a um, uh, I don't know, a man kind of trying to, not necessarily sharing my own experience. I mean, there's always 
part of you in whatever you make. Mm. Yes, but kind of, I'm really, really fascinated. And, and to be honest, kind of most of the time scared. So it happens at the same time of males. Yeah. I mean, right. Um, I think fascination and fear is quite a good yeah. combination, isn't it? Yes. And so, yeah, I'm just like exploring that. What it, I mean, I don't, I have no answer. It's not like I have an answer. I'm trying to sh share it with others. Mm. It's just my fascination and yeah, that fear that we talked about is that I'm trying to kind of, if, if possible, share that with, with others. And, and you, I don't think you've made that many prints this year, have you? Because you've been focusing more on painting because you've been in the studio. But yeah, when, well, like, I guess like anybody, everybody else, I had different plans for this year and I was going to go to different places, some residences, and I had some plans for make new prints, but obviously everything got canceled. I, 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 although I, I ended up going to two uh, residences, one was like right in the beginning of pandemic and back then it, things were a little loose and so I could go and make a, a series of uh, lithographs. And couple, maybe two months ago, I also went to another residence in, here in California, really small. It was only like three of us, so it was possible to do that. So other than these two, no, I haven't made a uh, print this year, which wasn't that, it's not that bad. Um, I mean, it kind of shift, I, made me to, I mean, I have to make images. It doesn't really, at the end, it doesn't really matter how I make it, right? I mean, if I can make prints, great. If not, like uh, right now, I just make paintings and drawings. Sure, but what, when you're when you're making your prints, what what are your favorite printmaking techniques? I I don't really have favorite technique. I, I like them all uh, because still, I mean, I started making prints I think nine years ago, eight years ago, and the first time I. I, I found that I always possible for me to make print. I was just so fascinated and I'm still fast. It's just really fascinating. So I don't really, it doesn't really matter. Etch, I like it all etching, lithography, screen printing. It really depends. Um, I mean, may, if I have to choose one, maybe I choose etchings, maybe. Uh, not really. I mean, they're all really, but uh, because maybe because I mean, uh, my main thing is, I mean, I really, really care about drawing. And maybe the type of drawing that I tend to do are sometimes, most of the time, more linear. So because of that, maybe etchings is closest. But really, I mean, I try, I, 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 as, if, I, if I have access to any of these, I would do them. So and basically, uh, the way I choose what kind of technique I use is kind of combination of if I have access to specific facility that I need and also the type of image I make. Um, and did, did you want to show us something more, Teza? Have you got... Um... Um, yeah, <laughs> yeah, I, well, and on the wall I put, I, I was, I could find the, the drawing that uh, I made for the print that I have in the, uh, in the frame. I don't know if you can see it because it's a little, uh, so it's a, as you see, it's a collage of different material tape, there's acetate, they're just, um, and not really archival thing. But uh, this is usually uh, how I work when I make, especially screen prints. Uh, I usually started from, it begins I, when, I, when I found a, a sketch or drawing that I'm interested. I mean, uh, so this evolves and create this as I'm printing. So I go back between the, the collage and also the, the, the print. So usually when I end up with, uh, when I'm making a print project, I, uh, when I finish the project, I also have a, a collage drawing beside, which is the, so it's like, it, there's a conversation between the, the collage and also the, the, the prints, the edition. Sure. Yeah. And, and because you make a lot of draw, you do a lot of drawing, don't you? You make a lot of unique works, drawn works yeah. in color and in black and white. So it sounds as though they, they really kind of feed into each other all the time. As you say, there's a conversation going on. Yeah. I mean, it, it's that. And also the, the prints that I make also, they kind of, there's always conversation between them. I was going to show you, um, it's kind of related to the, 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 the print I, this print. So this was a really quick study screen print. Uh, 
I mean, it's not really edition, it's just, it's, I think I printed two. Uh, this was just an image I had uh, and I had to get it out and it was kind of one of my first screen print ever. So I made this and then this image that I have in the fair kind of evolved from that. Sure. I mean, different scenario and all that, but mm -hmm. I, I some of the elements like that chair and that figure, I was like kind of interested and I was trying to figure out what is going on. So, mm -hmm. and then I made the drawings and collage and then the screen print. So it's always like, there's really no definite division between drawing, painting and printmaking for me. It's just, they're all over the place and they're really one thing. Yeah, and, and I'm gonna ask you one last question, um, sure. which um, we, we talked about briefly um, when we met the other day on Zoom, about your interest in proofs and canceled prints, because I, I said to you that I think you're the only artist whose website I've ever seen that has a section for proofs and canceled prints, which I just thought was completely fascinating. So perhaps you could tell us quickly Quickly about that. Yeah, sure. Uh, well, for me, the I mean, what uh, I mean in printmaking, what fascinates me, what I like the most is the process. I mean, of course, I'm trying to get the best results possible, but really, I don't really care about the final image. It's the fun that you have in your proofing mainly, and uh, so always, like I feel like all the proofs that I make because. Um, it's not just, I just proof, it's, it's not always a print. My proofs are usually kind of combination of drawings. I have some proofs of some recent um, etchings I made. Uh, so this is the final, it's mm. a etching. So, uh, so my proofs are usually like stuff like this. I mean, really yeah. quick and not really clean. And I, then I go back and draw on them with whatever I yeah. have. And yeah. I make notes, sometimes just random notes that I have to write somewhere else. But, but like when I'm working on these images, like these proofs are everything. It's kind of, I, I see them as a records of my days. So they're kind of become really, in a way, personal, even more personal mm -hmm. than the final edition. Yeah, because I like, I like a diary. Is something for others. But the proofs are the one that are for me and like our, the, the records of my, my, my days in the studio. And so I really kind of have a kind of, I don't know, personal uh, relation to them. Mm. Um, but I, lo I love the way that you, although you're saying that they're very personal and they're like a diary of your day, you've put them all on your website. You know, they've got all these beautiful kind of notes and marks in the margins and um, it's worth everyone, everyone please do take a look at those because I think they're really gorgeous. Um, I've got a question here, which I'm going to ask you, and then I'm gonna move on to Sarah. Um, so um, I hope it's, I'm not sure if it's Fiza or Fitzer, um, says, how does the figure transform through your process of drawing, painting, and printmaking from the original that you found in the archives? Was it how, how was the, I, I, I think I think they're talking about the the, the transformation from the original image, mm -hmm. uh, the historical image, to the contemporary piece that you make to, to your own kind of visual language. Right, right. So so that those those pictures that I look at and uh, it's kind of my part of the big part of my practice. I just collect images constantly, which actually gets out of control uh, at some time. But so those are just really just. I don't really care about who those people are or what is happening in the image. It's just a beginning moment. I just need an image that kind of interests me and for ridiculous reasons. It, again, I don't have to know that person. I mean, sometimes I, I go and like, I, I'm just curious to see what is going on or who is this person, but really it's, it's the posture or it's like the kind of jacket that that person is wearing or like that beautiful broken, something over is these silly things that just visually interest me and mm. then i just get that i make some drawings out of it and then makes more drawings based on those drawings so at the end what i end up has nothing to do with that image it's just an excuse to make me to make something based on yeah it's it's a, it's often i think to do with sensation or emotion or just a gesture or something that exactly. kind of resonates with you isn't it 
Exactly. Thank you, Morteza. Um, Thank you. I, I think there are more questions, but I am going to move on to Sarah for now, and we'll try and go back to them because we've got 20 minutes left. Um, so, Sarah, hello. Hi. Sarah's in Greenwich. Um, and Sarah and I um, have known each other for many years as well. Um, I think I discovered Sarah's work um, in a show that Eileen Cooper curated at the RA, which was um, about the diversity of the printmaking medium. And I think that's where we kind of met. And then we've had a, we've had a great trip to New York together as well, haven't we? Um, and got to know each other over the years. So Sarah, tell us about where you are at the moment. So I'm in, in London, in Greenwich, and in my um, little teeny studio in the house, um, which is a drawing studio and sort of office space usually. My printmaking studio is down the bottom of the garden in a couple of garages, um, but there's no internet connection down there, so I'm in here. That's right. But I've transported some prints <laughs> Amazing. And usually this, you know, I work with things pinned up here, so it was easy to do. So these are um, the two pieces that are in the show. And the, these are the blocks. So beneath the, that is, there's the block. And then I've also left up a few drawings, including this one, which is the drawing that relates most clearly to the, the print. I wasn't sure which one that you were going to show, but... And, and speaking just then with Morteza about the business of kind of atmosphere and sensation as opposed to a literal um, translation of something, that I think it relates quite nicely to your work um, in terms of the landscape, but not necessarily being a specific location. Can you tell us a bit about your, just summarise your practice for those who, who don't know about your work? So, so always, oh, both up, there we are. Um, so all, always landscape, um, that has been my, uh, what I felt most connected with forever. And I often think that I, uh, and, and in, in terms of that, then the act of being in landscape, so walking and working from landscapes, drawing, while I'm out in landscape has always been the sort of first stage of, of where I'm working and then I'll bring lots of things back into the studio and then, then begins a sort of long process of, of making work when I feel as if what happens is I get further and further away from what are quite often quite fast sketches and and, and drawings and um, so in some ways, my work becomes more and more minimal, but, but that's just the process of making. I, I don't intend that particularly, but I think I bring things down to a series of um, less complicated planes than, mm. the, than the space that I've been in. And, and can, you show us your, can you show us your block there? Can you tell us a bit about the, yeah. the process? Because... Um, I, I love this idea that the, the, there's a kind of contemplative nature of the images kind of relates to the, 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 the speed of the technique, which is very considered and soft and um, the, the, the technique of Japanese woodcut, and it, I, I came to it, you know, fairly recently, maybe, I don't know, 12, 12 years ago, something like that. And I'd, I'd had a background in, in etching, strangely. Um, and, and I think people who make etchings often also make relief prints, but I didn't particularly, I mean, of course I knew Japanese woodcuts, but I didn't really know much about the technique. So I came to it, you know, fairly recently. And it's, it, there's something rather wonderful about it because it uses watercolor, it uses brushes, it's hand printed. It couldn't be further away from the sort of big tech of of um, making copper etchings, which is what I I used to do. And and slowly but surely, when I'm making prints, then Japanese woodcut or relief prints has has completely taken over. It is quite calming thing to do, um, and I think it's definitely caused my work to be calmer as well because of the the method 
I, I think there's a, I mean, there was another conversation between printmakers earlier on in the fair, and we were talking just about this business of, it, of the ritual being very cathartic. Um, I mean, I, I find the same thing. I've sli I became, become slightly obsessed recently with wrapping prints, and I kind of go into this trance when I'm doing it. I find that really therapeutic as well. Um, can you can you show us the pastel? Um, do you have the past a pastel there as well? Can you talk a bit about the relationship between the unique um, the unique works and the prints? Because you've been making more pastels in the past year or two, haven't you? Yes, I mean they they are trained as a painter, so there's always been that aspect to my practice. But I feel like I can't do one without out the other, the drawing and works on paper now is what I do. So this is, I just, can you see it like that? Do I need to bring it closer or can, is that good enough? That's good, that's quite good. So um, the, the way that I make the drawings, uh, as I use um, soft pastels, but I sort of, they sort of disintegrate as I'm working. So I often think that what I'm really doing is working with dust. <laughs> and and um, it, it, one of the things I really like is the relationship between print and, and original works, that there's something I, you know, I think often I make my drawings less and less distinctly like a drawing and I make my prints now to look less and less like a print so that they often look much more like watercolours mm. and just lately I've, I've stopped cutting very much so th in this can you see that so in this the colours on the there's no cut marks here at all it's just flat and because you apply um because you apply inks or watercolour with a brush then you can quite carefully hit an edge um so i mean i think it's sort of a bit on anarchic from somebody who sort of spent so many years in, in in print studios that the idea that there's no cut mark and there's there's not that much control is really compelling mm -hmm. <laughs> you know it's a very nice way to work so I apply, you can see in the image here that those are applied with a brush and I just hit the same mark on the block as much as I can. Mm. I mean, we all know as printmakers that imagining that you ever get to exactly the same of whatever technique you're, you're using is, is, um, is not really possible. Um, no. No. But you approximate it. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. And just hope that no one lines them all up and compares. Absolutely. Thank God. <laughs> <laughs> yes. um, and you you have experienced some changes this year as well, haven't you, in terms of your working situation and previously having worked in a in a very tight group of printmakers supporting each other and now your yeah working solo so tell tell us just a little bit about that and then um we can go back to the questions so um as i said my sort of background was in was in um editioning studios i worked, worked for a long time with a rather wonderful printmaker called hugh stoneman and and through that experience met eileen cooper and we we shared a studio for 20 years now um so Eileen's, some of Eileen's prints were made at the bottom of the garden and um, they would be additioned here even though she was making them in her studio. Anyway, at the beginning of um, lockdown, we, we just ended up knowing that we had to sort out, we, we have um, the young printmaker Julia who's actually rather marvellously now working in Tamsin's studio. So, I just packed up all the stuff and off it went to Julia. And um, so I'm, I have moved from being in a space where three times a week, probably some, someone else's work was happening in, in the space to now it's, it's just my space. And that's a huge change for me. Um, and it's been a very um, 
well it, it, interesting thing to come to terms with you know of of, of it it being a solo um studio for me mm. and there are lovely things about it but i do miss that sense of of working closely with people um i mean i think lots of people people that haven't been able to go to their studios where there are other people printmaking is a very um sharing and close world isn't it and that's yeah, a really yeah. nice thing that people are ha happy and willing to share practice um so luckily you know everyone sort of you know you're, you're, you still feel connected with that world but um, and who knows, you know, how, how we'll go forward. But I mean, this is a lot longer than we imagined. And Julia is doing a spectacular job of working in, with Tamsin's studio. And I think they've now set something up, which is very, very special. I don't think we'll take that apart. Oh, well, well, I, I, <laughs> you're welcome to have her anytime. <laughs> 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 I can say, but sorry. If you... yeah. <laughs> and, and Julia, you know, would also be working on my work. I really, really hope that that can happen again, that she'll be able to edition my work too sometime. I think Thanks it will. I, th I think it will certainly happen again. I think we will all. We'll all come around. We, we will some, we will all see a return to normality next year, I am sure. Yeah. <laughs> Um, well, thank you, Sarah. I mean, I just, it just, it's really lovely to see all the work together and I really appreciate you bringing it up to the house and coming across well, from, from the garden. Up here. <laughs> um, I've got a question here. Um, and in fact, I'll, I, I'm going to go back to a question for Morteza first and then a, 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 I think a final question for Lizzie. So, well, Teza, um, we have a question here from Jeremy White, and he ha is talking about colour, which is really interesting because in the older um, photographs, I, I presume the colour is not not at all similar to the perhaps to the those vivid the vivid palette that you kind of use in your prints. He says, "How do you arrive um, to the printed colours from the ones in the photographs?" Oh, oh, well, that's funny because usually. Well, first of all, not every, every image I make are based on these photographs that I was talking about. Uh, sometimes I just make drawings of these photographs that are usually black and white. Uh, so the, the, the colors are kind of, I don't, that's actually, that's something I, I thought about before, but now I'm thinking again. It's kind of like, because they're really saturated, because these photographs or these moments are really black and white and I don't want to say dull but with no color so maybe this fully saturated color is kind of like respond to that lack of color from the, the original source uh, I mean the colors are all from me I kind of make up everything uh, there's no relation between uh, my prints and the photographs really I mean formally and also uh, in terms of subject matter so they're all totally made up. And, and he also says, and I think this is, this is quite a nice question for everybody really, and I think we, we know what the answer is. Um, do you ever make mistakes or is a mistake not really able to be defined in this process? Never. <laughs> Far too professional to make mistakes. <laughs> I mean, it's all mistakes, that's all I do. I mean, I I mean some, of the, some of the best prints can be mistakes, can't they? Tamsin, what do you think about mistakes? Yeah, I mean, it's interesting that um, he said, can it even be defined as a mistake? Because I guess there's, there's that whole um, area of wanting to work with what is fluid and unpredictable and the the realm of mistakes, I suppose, but perhaps it isn't a mistake if, depending on what your aim is. <laughs> um, I think you have to re completely embrace mistake making if you're a printmaker, don't you? Yeah. Because of that element of chance. I mean, you have to have, but, but I've experienced both sides because for additioning, you do perhaps need to bring in a certain amount of precision and science and clean fingers. And mm. <laughs> there's so many, variables where things can go wrong that 
I find for auditioning, you need to kind of stay on top of it, but certainly in the, in the more of the creative making exploratory phase, then mm. have to be open to, to the surprises. Sarah, do you, do you consider your work to be more precise and, and less, um, less yeah. kind of, <laughs> no, I think are you allowed to make mistakes? Oh God. I mean, I think the whole, uh, as Morteza said, it, in a way, the journey is, is a mistake. You know, you can't, if you set out with too clear an idea of the image you're going to make, you'd be bored before you got there. So I do think that the whole, um, method of image making is allowing it to direct you which is sort of mis making mistakes isn't it you've got to be brave enough to make bad work in order to make good work mm. yeah um we've got one last kind of question stroke comment i think which is a really nice point to make from lizzie to, fi to finish up with um to respond to and she says that she thinks there's been a shift this year in the social aspect of working with other artists in the studio. Um, obviously, people haven't necessarily been able to be physically together, but she says sharing, commenting, feeding off their creativity and being inspired by their feedback. I mean, I suppose that relates partly to social media, but I, I, you know, I hope that although this is not the same as being together, that forums like this allow people to um, you know, be inspired by others and ask questions and kind of go away and have other ideas and I think there has been, hopefully there's, there's been a bit of shift in the, in the culture this year um, and that kind of sense of working collaboratively even, even if you can't be together. Uh, but, but also how creative people have been in order to make work, many people have not been able to get into studios. Um, and yet people find, you know, so many people have worked on their kitchen tables, haven't they? And um, I think that's a really positive thing um, to, it's sustaining making work. And um, so very important that, that you find a way, otherwise yeah. you feel like yourself. What else is there to do? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I think our, I think our time is up. I'm going to see if any if there are any more questions. Um, people are saying thank you, which is lovely. Um, I want to thank all the artists for um, coming along today virtually. Um, it's been really, really wonderful to hear about your work and um, Morteza, especially wonderful to have you joining us from California. Um, and I hope to see you all again at the fair next year. I'm absolutely confident that we'll all be there together next year. So thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you. <laughs>